and thank you for joining us for our next session. We were just having a lovely chat backstage, so I'm super excited to bring that on stage. We're going to be discussing China Tech Ascendant. China's digital ecosystem is rapidly expanding. Its enterprise Internet of Things, otherwise known as IoT, which was a new term for me, market is estimated to be approximately $294 billion by 2026. By 2040, autonomous vehicles will make up over 40% of new automobile purchases, according to McKinsey, and private equity is investing in digitization and helping accelerate technological growth in China. So here to explain what all of this means to us, I have Tian Lin, Managing Director of N31 Capital, and Benson Zhu, President of MENA HIK Vision. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'd like to start with kind of big picture. How is the Internet of Things transforming China's economy and data ownership throughout the country? Thank you so much, Susan. Well, uh, I really appreciate that we have this opportunity to participate for the FII. Well, if you don't mind, just give me one minute for a brief in introduction about our company, Hike sure. Vision. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Hike Vision is the world number one ART solution provider, which is exactly related to the p topic you are asking. Yeah, so talk about uh, this AI, uh, the IoT technology bring to China economy. Uh, I would like to just uh, to uh, talk about what is IoT. Maybe people don't understand mm -hmm. about it. It majorly includes three parts. The first part, it is the device, you can see all the sensors. And the second part, it is the connectivity, which is transmission of the uh, information. And the last part, it is application. That's the major three part of IoT. So during the past years, what this IoT bring to, to China's economy? For example, in manufacturing industry itself, uh, we have multiple sensors which can replace the human being just to detect, like the, uh, detect or analysis the detective items or to increase the efficiency. So in totally, the, for industry, uh, manufacturing industry, it will significantly uh, reduce the human cost and uh, increase the uh, accuracy. Like in the uh, smart transportation, we use the IoT devices to gather in all these uh, traffic information just to, to uh, increase the, you can say, to reduce the traffic jams also a lot and also to make the uh, traffic more safe. And like for the uh, uh, oil and gas industry, which I believe in Saudi it is very important. So in this industry, using IoT in technology, it will help you to monitor like fire detection, leaking detection, and also for HSE, like healthy and safety detection, like hair mail detect, etc. So it makes the people safer. And also in, at homes, there are smart homes, which is also part of the IoT. It gives you more convenient life quality. So in conclusion, I, from our point of view, that the IoT itself brings the whole economy of China more uh, competitive by reducing the cost, increase the efficiency, reduce the risk, and enhance the living environment. Mm -hmm. Tian? Hi, uh, my name is Tian Lin. Uh, I'm a partner at uh, M31 Capital. Uh, our firm is a uh, uh, growth VC based in Shanghai, but we invested a lot of companies uh, out of China with a global ambition, uh, like uh, Bidance, for example. Uh, as for the IoT question, you know, from a investor's perspective, uh, I can say a couple of things. Uh, number one, right now in the world, we have uh, you know several billion smartphones um, altogether. But to give you guys a sense, the number of IoT devices uh, is probably in the trillions. So that in itself uh, is a huge market. And secondly, you know. In very simple terms, what do we do with IoT? An important part is to collect data and digitize the real world. So the data part, uh, you know, again, can unlock a lot of values. And then uh, you know, the third thing is when you can digitize everything, and when the penetration of IoT uh, you know, is everywhere, uh, in our opinion, there will be a lot of second derivatives, you know, business models. 
because previously we don't know what's going on, but with IoT everywhere, we can know precisely what going on, what's going on, and we can analyze you know, a huge amount of data to predict what will happen. So that basically has great implications in a lot of, for, for example, manufacturing, uh, you know, everyday life, you know, smart home device, and for example, electronic vi uh, vehicles, right? Uh, the EVs has a lot more sensors than the traditional, you know, uh, combustion engine autos. Yeah, so that's my sense. So when we talk about electronic vehicles now, we're thinking electronic vehicles that we're driving, but driverless cars are closer than we think. So how will driverless cars uh, evolutionize transportation and ease traffic and congestion, for example, in cities in China, but not just China, I mean around the world. Riyadh, for example, has terrible traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll start. Um, uh, to be frank, I think pure driverless cars are still maybe a decade or two away mm -hmm. um, from us, just because solving the last 1% of uh, driverless car problem actually requires 99% of the effort, data training, all the corner cases, et cetera. Uh, once we get there, you know, the whole transportation systems would be you know, very different from today. For example, we will probably no longer require traffic light. And also, as an example, the concept of owning a car would actually change, right? Because everything is autonomous, you can just hop on a car with your phone, with a click of your phone, and you probably don't need a vehicle anymore. When you get off, uh, you know, for, for, for example, at FII, the car will just park itself or go pick up someone else. So the concept of transportation would really uh, change a lot. But in between these one or two decades, I think even just, you know, partial, uh, you know, driving assistance would actually make people uh, feel very different when we, for, for example, if we need to drive from San Francisco to Los Angeles, it used to be a very daunting process, but now it became much easier. Thanks, Mr. Lin. Actually, I totally agree with him. Uh, what he said, maybe it's about the vision 10 years to go, 20 years to go. From us, uh, from techno technology, we, I believe that currently it's already changing the traffic already currently. For example, by this driverless car, first of all, using this uh, drivers or you can say autonomous uh, navigation system, it will give you the better routers to uh, have a faster, a faster driving experience. And also it will also reduce the, you can say the traffic jams. That's one part of it. And secondly, uh, for this uh, auto driving, you know, uh, it will avoid like sudden brake. Maybe, maybe brake is something you do it every day or every time, but you don't know that this kind of break, how it is important for the whole traffic system. Sometimes it's just like a butterfly effect. So this kind of auto driving, when we reduce the brake, it will make the traffic just more smoothly. Very important. And also auto driving, it's some, it will reduce the uh, risk of the human driving because sometimes people are tired of driving or drunk of driving, but this kind of thing will be totally avoided. So I believe that uh, this auto driving nowadays is already giving the benefit for the people, or for the environment. But of course, in 10 years, 20 years, it will be totally different. I've heard mixed predictions about how far, how far along we really are with driverless cars, but also flying cars. <laughs> I just recently moved from Washington DC to Dubai, and I sort of feel like sometimes Dubai is like this cartoon that we grew up with in America, in America called the Jetsons. I don't know if anybody else here knows about the Jetsons, but it's this futuristic city and everyone drives around in flying cars. And actually, rather shockingly, the dad in the cartoon was born in 2022. <laughs> um, so how far are we from flying cars? I mean, are flying cars and driverless cars on the same trajectory? Well, uh I believe that uh, US and China are the two countries who are leading this technology. You have said that Jack, Jack, Jackson, right? Mm -hmm. And there's also one company in China called Xiaofeng. Actually recently, they have just demonstrated the, uh, uh, drive, uh, the, the flying car in Dubai, in Jitex. Actually, I was there uh, seeing them flying. Uh, actually, technology-wise, uh, it's, it's already started, but to uh, be mature, I'm sure it'll take even longer time, maybe 20 years or 30 years. 
So currently, I believe that uh, uh, to have this kind, to bring this kind of thing into reality, we have to do several. We have to conquer several uh, difficulties. For the first thing, technology itself, it needs to in improvement. Currently, it's just a very basic car, and secondly, it's about the uh, regulations. You know, when we have something new, which will definitely change the whole system of the country, then it must be have some regulations. Otherwise, it will be a chaos uh, situation. And the third thing, which I believe it's the concept of the of the human uh, habit, uh, whether they are suitable or whether they want or how they really consider it in their daily life. So this kind of thing, I believe it's there's a long term we have to think about it. Yeah, it's hard to put a number on how far we are from flying cars. I certainly hope it comes faster. Uh, you know, when it comes that uh, you know, traffic congestions would be a term that in, in the past. Uh, but I would add, uh, add on top of Vincent's point that regulatory, you know, for transportation, regulatory is always um, a big thing. Right? People say EV could be a big computer with a you know, big battery and more powerful CPU and GPU. But in fact, the manufacturing process and also you know, to be able to sell it in a country, uh, it's very different from like, consumer electronics, like a cell phone. Right? So you have to go, go through all the safety and you know, tr all those regulatory. So it actually takes a bit longer, in my opinion. So you mentioned that the U.S. and China are at the forefront of the kind of innovation around vehicles, at least. But obviously, it's no secret that the U.S. and China are geopolitical foes right now. And the U.S. has announced sanctions, particularly on chips. Do, how does that affect investment in these Internet of Things technologies? Uh, to be frank, we're still trying to figure things out. and. Uh, a lot of uh, my friends in the U.S. are also trying to figure, you know, it's a, like 200 pages document, uh, the sanction itself uh, of what will happen. But uh, just for the chip industry in China in general, uh, I think the short term speaking, a lot of companies would indeed have a lot of difficulties, you know, just to keep doing what they're doing right now. Uh, but on the other hand, it basically forced you know, China to really put a lot of money and effort into developing its own uh, semiconductor uh, industry from you know, start to finish. The manufacturing process of a semiconductor is very long. Uh, the chip we use uh, on our phone, from start to finish, one, chips, uh, one, one chip takes two and a half to three months to make. There are like 700 different, seven, 800 different steps. So the silicon just keeps moving in the factory. So it's a very complicated process. It involves a lot of companies and technologies. So that's why short term, it's very you know, hard for China to uh, you know, keep doing what it's doing. But eventually, from an investor per perspective, I see a lot more we can invest. So that's the other side of the story. Mm. From my point of view, that uh, technology is always always in neutral uh, position. And it depends on uh, how you use it, who you use it. Uh, as a company, uh, as a leading AIoT solution company, our aim is always to bring the value to the customers, to the society. So we will continuously uh, uh, invest in the R&D in technology uh, to make better product line solutions. Uh, whether there's uh, uh, you know conflict between China and U.S., uh, we'll try to conquer all these difficulties. And in the meanwhile, it may also bring us some opportunities during this tough time, since we are the biggest in this market. So uh, we want to focus more on business, on technology, purely, rather than talk about this conflict. So you don't really see politics like that's happening in the CCP Congress last week, for example, affecting investment and tech? For sure, there's some kind of effect. And uh, for sure, it will give us some difficulties. But in the end, uh, if you don't face this one, you'll face some other things. The only solution is to focus yourself 
and trying to bring value to the market. And the market will talk about the result. What has the market been saying since last week? Since last week? Hard to read, but my own opinion is, you know, the market is overreacting a little bit. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, just from a pure financial perspective, I know for a fact, you know, financially, a lot of you know, Chinese companies are still doing very well. So if you really look at the multiples, um, you know, uh, PE or whatever, it's really, really cheap, historically cheap. So we'll see. So private equity is investing in the expansion of digitization in China specifically. Why do you think that is? And maybe why not what other parts of the world? Uh, to start with, I think China in itself is a huge market. You know, even for, like you mentioned, the, the chip sanction, um, for a lot of US companies, China is at least 30% of their, where their revenue comes from. And so uh, that's one thing. And the other is, uh, I guess, the number of consumers is very unique. You have this one market that has 1.3, 1.4 billion people. So you have uh, a lot you can do, even if you just service a very small part of it, you can, the company itself can be very significant. Well, I agree with uh, Mr. Lin as well, because uh, during the past years, China is growing very fast. And nowadays, if you look back about the China economic growth, most of the traditional business is already in a very, you can say, stable or mature stage. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that all investors, they believe that uh, we cannot grow at the same speed in the coming future. But for digitalization, uh, I believe it's still the, it's still the starting stage. Uh, there's great potential because the market is big. And uh, also, I believe that China, we have some good facilities already. For example, we have uh, talent. We have so many talent who work, uh, study in the high, uh, uh, institute you know, or who s study abroad and they come back and to bring the technology. We have the facility like we have so many good companies, good uh, infrastructures and also uh, the China government itself they have released many uh, you can see regulations to encourage uh, the companies to uh, invest uh, this kind of a uh, trans digital transformation period of time. So Getting back to the kind of Internet of Things concept, it seems like it's quite costly. So how can the cost be justified? Is it justified? And oh. why? Well, that's a good question, actually. That's a question uh, we were asked by our customers uh, daily. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you purchase the solution. At one time, it is costly. But when we talk about this kind of benefit, we don't talk about one time, we talk about long term. Mm. So what we do uh, for, the, uh, for the customers, we will evaluate the value for them for three years or five years. For example, what human resource cost you have now, what power consumption you have now, what risks you have now. And for us, if you use this kind of IoT solution, maybe today you invest more than that, but uh, that kind of uh, cost I have mentioned will be reduced a lot. And when we like just pass a significant time and afterward, it will be much more value. And from an investment perspective, are you able to predict the kind of rate of return on a frontier that's still so new? Uh, yeah, actually just um, to add to your question, we don't think IoT as a cost. We always think it as a investment, just like you know, GPUs, the chip that does all the AI trainings are extremely expensive, but people still buy it. So what we usually do is just go to the customers of the companies like Hitvision and ask them, you know, how do you justify your investment? What do you get out of, you know, what kind of return do you get out of it? Right? There are companies or customers that just want to try it out, so it's uncertain, but there are more companies that really can measure this and know what they're buying and what they can get out of it. So. Is there a sustainable driving force behind IoT? Uh, I think it's just, uh, you know, the whole 
Uh, IoT is basically there's part software, there's part hardware. Together, they provide the function services. Uh, I would think in both sections there are, uh, you know, there are the trend to drive down the cost, manufacture and better computer code. So at the end of the day, I think all the innovation, when, when cost is a very interesting thing, when it lowers by like 10% every year, eventually, you know, people's view towards this kind of thing really changes, right? You can just get 100 IoT in your home. Yeah, I would like to add one more thing. Yeah, cost of course definitely is something we have to talk about, but sometimes IoT will give you even additional opportunities. Uh, during the past years, we see the trend uh, of this uh, digitalization, or you can say IoT trend, from the single uh, sensoring to multiple perception, from single system to integrated system, from getting the information, recording information to uh, have uh, AI and deep learning applications. These kind of trending will combine, uh, will connect different industry and bring some kind of new opportunity. And once you capture this kind of new opportunity, it is more than invest itself. It brings you a new chance. And, uh, you know, climate change is a topic that's top of mind for everyone, especially in China. Are there any concerns in the kind of production and manufacturing and everything that the Internet of Things entails? Are there any concerns when it comes to the effect of its potential effect on climate? I mean, when it comes to manufacture, there is always a concern, and it's also from the policymakers uh, in in China. They're also very conscious of it. Uh, China sets its own goal of carbon neutral and everything. Uh, one thing is, right now, China is the world's number one solar producer. You know, the companies in that space, like I said, drove down the cost of solar by like 90% in the past 10 years. So, you know, today if you look at Europe, you know, it can really help the energy transition from traditional to you know, renewable. And China also has uh, world's largest battery makers, which also helps the you know, climate um, and energy transition. Yeah, I think that. Uh, when we talk about the, uh, green, uh, the environment, apparently it's about the uh, uh, green energy, but what's behind the green energy, there are much more uh, that we can analyze. For example, what is your efficiency? Uh, how do you deal with the pollution, right? So this kind of thing, I think IoT is one of the solution for it. For example, if you can, uh, in just to uh, improve your pr uh, manufacture procedure itself, it will definitely reduce the power consumption, human, human resource, and come back, then it will, it will relate it to the environment. And in similar, if we can use the uh, solar panels, uh, this kind of system itself, it also reduce the uh, uh, pollution to the environment. And uh, in totally, we can see it's not just uh, one or two point, it's kind of system thinking uh, to make it uh, more uh, convenient for the environment. So you said that tech is the great equalizer, but unfortunately everything in life can be weaponized. So how do you respond to growing concerns around data privacy issues when it comes to the Internet of Things? Well, uh, for let, let's talk about the data trend first. Uh, the previously, when we talk about data, it's, it's we mostly about the online infos. Uh, nowadays, we, we connect up. We, uh, the IoT itself is transferring the offline data to online data. And also, it combines the uh, offline data with the online data together. So I believe that this kind of uh, uh, trend itself will keep going on. And what's more important is about how you how you use it. For us, we, uh, we don't normally uh, talk about uh, uh, privacy of data because we have uh, our R&D, we have uh, our lab, which to significantly just to protect our customers' data. And in the meanwhile, uh, there's regulation in China, also in different uh, countries, 100% follow up these uh, regulations to protect the uh, privacy and data. Yeah, we invest in Bydance, which is the parent company of TikTok. So we're pretty familiar with the subject. I think one 
one thing is, uh, you know, nowadays a lot of Chinese companies um, are very aware of all these regulations. Like five, ten years ago, you know, people weren't aware of all the rules, so they were doing things in their own way. But once they know it, you know, there's tons of you know help, consultant, you know, uh, dialogue with uh, regulators to try to make things, you know, that's uh, compliant. In every local market, they have like 150 different local market. They're actually doing this. So, so does the American companies, of course. They were just trying to follow the rules and steps. Correct. I mean, having invested in ByteDance, do you have concerns about these latest calls to ban TikTok from the U.S. altogether? I mean, this is coming from the FCC commissioner. Yeah, I hear this kind of rumors like almost every year, or maybe every half a year. But, you know, frankly, um, I would think just banning a consumer application uh, is a little bit complicated. I really don't know where things will go, but I can only hope for the best. Well, it's interesting because obviously, as you say, these, these rumors kind of come up ever so often. And the reaction of the American consumers towards the idea that TikTok might be banned is just absolutely not we're not having it because they love TikTok so much but obviously there are concerns about yeah. how the algorithm reaches Americans versus other parts of the world for example yeah. so but was it a good investment it is a very 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 good investment even with all these worries but I would have to say that um, the important thing really is to try to build the trust so as the company you really you know the CEO and all the executives and all the engineers just, you know, they're very focused on trying to make the product better, to tailor to the consumers, to bring a better experience to the consumers, uh, and to conform to whatever, you know, regulatory requirements are. It's unfortunate, uh, you know, companies could be, you know, you know, you know stuck in between all these um, politics. It's just very unfortunate. So we have about three minutes left between the two of you. I'd like you to paint us a picture about what the world in this Internet of Things space is going to look like by 2030. 2030 is the buzz year here in this neighborhood that we're in. What is the world going to look like by then? Um, if I have to, you know, if I put it in one sentence, it's, um, you know, everything would be automated. Uh, you know, things will, you know, you will get things before you know you need it. I think that's the ultimate goal of all the IoT and data and al algorithms just to do, uh, you know, accurate predictions. So, it, uh, you know, decrease the friction uh, of all these user experiences. Yeah. For so, mind reading. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's Elon Musk's thing, right? So. <laughs> Let's get to him. Yeah. For us, as a human being, the most important three things in our daily life, one is our home, which is your family life, one is work, which is your career, and one is, you can say, entertainment, your social, social relationships. So I believe that in the 2030, the IoT will bring you like a more convenient home quality and a more efficient working environment and a better social relationship. That's, that's, I think, I cannot say the exact change, but I believe that's the trend. Do, are you seeing, um, I guess, cultural agility and openness to this kind of world that seems so different to what we've been used to? Mm. Will mindsets be able to keep up with how quickly technology is evolving? Mindsets always you know, change a little bit slower than the technology itself. But in the end, it doesn't have to be that drastic from a user experience perspective. Right? So for example, IoT can optimize the time it takes for me to get a car from 10 minutes to two minutes because there's all these optimizations. So it doesn't have to be, before I know I have a car, the car is already here. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way, but it really can shorten a lot of you know, time and energy wasted. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. I hope everyone else enjoyed it as much as I did. And 
I look forward to the machines and their mind reading and the flexibility and convenience of IoT. Yeah, thank, thank you, Max. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure.